All right. Good evening. Good evening, STEM community. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have three esteemed panelists that I want to share with all of our subscribers. But first, I wanted to introduce myself before we get started and give a little bit about who I am. And then I will introduce our panelists as we're going to discuss STEM entrepreneurship this evening. We have one hour, which is not a lot of time. So we're going to pack in a lot of information and some great questions from our um, audience. So I'm Dr. Kamala Goodwin. I am an academic dean of a STEM department at a technical college. Um, I am passionate about STEM. I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. And I'm mostly excited about STEM entrepreneurship and the marrying of the two. And so my passion in life is STEM advocacy, uh, entrepreneurship advocacy, but also the importance of combining STEM and entrepreneurship in um, educational spaces. So I will introduce Robert Gale first, and I'm going to read a little bit about who Robert is. He is the owner and chief network administrator of TechWare Group in Milwaukee, and he's been in business since 99, so a long while. He specializes in providing cutting edge PC IT services to customers across the country, as well as in Jamaica, which is where he's from. He's worked with small to medium sized businesses from clinics, law firms, private schools, and the like to large businesses like Menards, Ford, GM, XM Radio, and Marriott Hotels. I wanted to give a little bit about his mission and we will allow him to explain a little bit later, but his goal is to continue providing quality PC and IT services to customers throughout the country with a focus on the Caribbean. We'll welcome Robert Gale. Thank you, thank you very much. Next we have Daphne Wilson, who is the principal owner of Zoe Engineering, which was also founded in 99. And her company provides electrical power distribution, instrumentation and controls, plant automation, lighting and communication system engineering. She has experiences as a project manager, lead project engineer, construction and resident engineer, and designer on a variety of projects. She also um, has, she conceived the company out of a mission to serve a pre-existing and ongoing relationship in the local municipal water, wastewater, and power generation markets. Please welcome Daphne Wilson. Hi, thanks to be, thanks to have me. And lastly, but not least, is Bruce Spann. He is the president and CEO of Span and Associates. He's a civil engineer. He has practices in Wisconsin, Virginia, and North Carolina, and he's responsible for technical, administrative, and financial performance of the company, which provides engineering planning, design, and construction management services to Wisconsin, North Carolina, and the Commonwealth of Virginia, local governments, agencies, and private business corporations. He has more than 37 years of experience. Please welcome Bruce, Bruce Spann to our panel. Woo, you guys are smart people. That was a lot to say in one breath. Um, I wanted to start by asking a, a few questions of our panel. Um, I'll start with you, Robert. If you could just give us your story, share with us your story, how you decided to um, own a business, how you decided to um, major in a STEM field, Tell us a bit about who you are and share your story. You're on mute. Well, I, I got started in this um, uh, when I was in grad, graduate school. Um, I kind of switched. I started um, computer science. And part of my project and my for my portfolio was I was um, I put together a package for B2B business business relationships, right? And at that time in 99, the dot-com boom was just beginning. And so as part of part of my, I launched my business during that time as a project in, in, um, in graduate school. And I, I while working still in corporate, in corporate America, I maintained my business on the side. And um, in 2002, um, I left corporate America and became a full-time entrepreneur um uh focusing um on it services and delivery of such services to, to my to my friends who were also doing the business at the time 
to bring them, you know, sign with, with their IT services, doing all the all the uh, networking, all the um, account setup for all the new networks. So it kind of started. It started really, as I said, out of um, out of college and graduate school, and it became a passion and a strong passion in 2002 when I decided, like, you know what, I want to work for myself. Um, um, I've always, from high school, Kevin, I always liked electronics. So in high school, I was big into electronics. In fact. When I finished Marshall High School in 87, I was the first and only student still to this day that took four years of electronics. So in my senior in high school, I sat with like sophomores, uh, but my workload was different because I was a, I was a fourth year student in electronics. But back then, Cameron, you, you program uh, Fortran, COBOL. So there was limited programming language back then. So there wasn't much computer science back then. It's more, it more like uh, just just te technology, just tech, right? But over the years, you know, um, as things developed so rapidly with the, over the, over the decades, um, I, I found a niche, and my, my 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 interest in technology has only grown over the years. So, Robert, just a follow-up question. What was the linchpin to your IT career? What led you to decide, hey, this is what I want to do? Was it your classroom instruction? Was it your real-world experiences? What was the linchpin to your IT career? Well, um, since from, from the beginning, my, my first job, my first job that I had was I was a test, I was a tester at Oster Company in Glendale in high school. And that's about my senior year in high school. I would test defective um, circuit boards from like toasters and blenders. So my job in high school, imagine me as, 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 a, as a high school uh, student, my job was to test those to find why they failed when they returned back to the company. So so that, that interest was always there. But um, in, in, in graduate school, Kamala, when I, when I saw when I was as I was working, and I saw what I saw what I did, and the value of what I did to the company I worked for, I'm like, well, I can do that too. <laughs> so, so, so I was motivated, um, and, and and graduate school to say, you know what, if if I get this degree, which I did, I can do this myself, um, and the work I'm doing for my employer, why why not do it for myself? And so I took a it's a big big gamble, right? And I stepped out, and I haven't looked back. All right. We'll come back to you in a bit, Robert. I'm going to transition to Daphne, who's the owner of Zoe Engineering. Share with us your story as an African-American woman in a STEM field. Mm -hmm. um, if you consider just the Midwest, I've had the opportunity to work. I, I'm, I'm born in Chicago, but I was raised here in Milwaukee. And I, I'm a product, as we say, of our public school systems. And um, if you just if I just discuss my experience in the Milwaukee arena, I was always throughout high school, middle school and even in college was told, you know, you don't have the brain capacity. Um, you people, you know, can't succeed in this. And um, also being helpful, being from the neighborhood, um, you don't let people move you. You know, you prove them wrong. You look forward to prove people wrong. So. Um, just with the experience in Milwaukee, I mean, you know, there's good people, then there's some people that are not so great. So the not so great people really were the ones who pushed me to to prove that I could do better and uh, succeed in engineering. Um, so my experience in Milwaukee was really interesting, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to work for uh, CH2M Hill, which was a large company, as well as Eaton Cutler Hammer, as well as Siemens. And even as I traveled outside of the Wisconsin area, like I worked in Santa Ana, California, and that was wonderful. It was just a blended group of ethnicities. Um, everybody treated people well. I also had the opportunity in the 90s to work in Detroit. That was awesome. That was like the time of Boomerang, for those who remember that movie. And I remember I called my mom and I told her, you know, I said, everybody's black. Where usually when I went to Corvallis, Oregon, working for Siege to Hill, I had to call my mom and say, even the cleaning people white. So, you know, I've had different experiences, uh, positive and negative. But I will say the negatives are what are ones that spurred me on that and knowing this is what I wanted to do. I've always 
was ex ex interested in electricity. You know, we had the school rock house cartoons and the Benjamin Franklin with the key on the kite. I tried to do that one day. My mom was like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going outside, you know? So I was always interested in electricity. Um, also in Bible study, uh, I'm a Christian. The Lord is my everything. And I found out in studying, the, everybody heard of Job. You know, if you're not a Christian, you heard the trials of Job. And in it, there's actually a passage that where God is questioning Job and says, do you know, do the lightning bolts come to your throne and bow down to you? And I was like, OK, God, let man turn his lightning bolts and do something with it. I got to go into electricity. So I like tinkering around. I like fixing things. But as far as my experiences, Milwaukee was very limited, uh, pigeonholed kind of somewhat. Mm -hmm. And it was when I had the opportunity to travel outside of Milwaukee where my vision even got even broader and realized how pigeonholed 19 18 milwaukee operates but like i said that just pushed me to go past it can you talk a bit about your um classroom experiences unfortunately i mean msoe has come a long way since i started in 1985. um even in high school the gentleman uh robert was talking about electronic shop i went to milwaukee tech which is now bradley tech and trade i had the opportunity to study electronics I was one of six girls, actually one of my good friends now, we were one, we weren't in the same class, but we were one of six girls that graduated, but we were also one, probably two or three of people of color who graduated in electronic shop. And my first year at MSOE was kind of a breeze. I was kind of delusional about college. I said, see, college is so hard, but about four years of MSOE, I mean, of high school was my one year at, at MSOE. But I had professors back then, unfortunately. Um, my first professor, first class, looked at the roster and was like, Wilson? I said, yes. He said, uh, you can get out of my class now. You don't belong here. He said, women don't belong in engineering, especially people like you. And I was just, I was like, well, you know, I'm paying your salary, so you need to teach the class. And um, I, I did have some professors and even some students that did not want to you know you have lab partners didn't want to be in my be a, a group partner um sabotaged or just wouldn't work with me and so it wasn't everybody but that experience was there and um again it just pushed me further and again it wasn't everybody at msoe but it, at the time there were still some oldies but goodies that felt like i didn't belong there and i just pushed past it i could have made a big stink about it i was like i'll just prove you wrong and pass the class <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bruce, Bruce, you're the, the president of an organization. You're 37 years in the business. Can you talk a bit about your role to entrepreneurship um, and how you grew your business to span over three states? Yes, thank you, uh, Kamala. We all have uh, similar stories and, and uh, challenges that came in through our lives that, that brought us where we where we are. I'd first like to thank you for making me so much younger because you say I have 37 years of experience. I have 40, 43 years of experience actually. So I appreciate being six years younger. But uh, I, uh, growing up, uh, was fortunate in a grade school. I lived in a predominantly uh, black neighborhood. We were we were not in public housing, but we were not we were not rich. We were we were poor. But uh, the school that I the attend the elementary school that I attended, I was fortunate that I had three African American males that were all college graduates, and one in particular, uh, he really just took my family under his wing. That I had three other brothers, and he just really took a interest in wanting to help us succeed and i listened more than the other three so uh, i made it uh, i did heed some of his advice not enough but i did heed some of his advice um, and then through middle school and even even in, in in grade school and high school as well uh well what was fortunate for me was i i liked math and i'm sure robert and 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 daphne as well like math and so i always chose to major in math at grade school. Uh, well, grade school we didn't, but in uh, junior high school and, and high school, I was fortunate that I rate, that I did major in math 
because that's one of the important things that young people need to know is if you want to be in the STEM field, you need to take your math early. I, again, like I said, I didn't listen to all of the advice he gave me because if I had it to do over again, I would have joined the Upward Bound program in high school and I would have taken calculus and I would have taken chemistry while I was in high school and it would have helped me uh, be so much better at it once I got to college. But I'll fast forward. Um, I, after graduating from high school, I grew up in South Bend, Indiana. And uh, my senior year of high school, I decided I didn't want to go to my second hour class. I didn't want to skip school. So I went to the counselor's office. That was my first visit to the counselor's office as a um, senior in high school. And just so happened that a representative from Marquette University was visiting the school. And I talked to them and asked them if they wanted, if they had architectural engineering. Uh, also, I'll go back a little bit. I think I wanted to be an architect because I think I used to watch a TV show called The Brady Bunch. And he carried a briefcase and, and he was an architect because there were no architects in my neighborhood. So I, don't, I think that's why I said I wanted to be an architect. But uh, so I asked Marquette, came back about six weeks later. My counselor was like, weren't you that person that, that came when Marquette visited? And I said, yes. He said, well, I think they were interested in you and I think you should apply. So I did, and I applied to Purdue University and didn't apply to the school that was in my backyard, uh, which is Notre Dame University. Nothing wrong with it academically, but back then in the 70s, I didn't like the attitude of the students there. Their football team especially was very good. They expected to win national championships every other year. God made us number one and all those types of things. I'd hear them say, and I didn't want to go there. But So I did come to Marquette. At Marquette, my first year of school there, my moment with people giving me a challenge to prove them wrong was the assistant dean of the College of Engineering. Before even midterm grades had come out, we all were assigned to go visit our, our counselors, and I think he was my counselor. So sat down with him, and, and a moment or two later, he's like, you have very good tonal qualities. You ever thought about being a speech or journalism major? I'm like, well, why don't you let me flunk out first? Grades haven't even come out. But I graduated, left, and uh, getting fast forward, I came back to Milwaukee in 93 to work for an African-American-owned engineering company, uh, an amazing individual who also happened to have been a graduate of Marquette University, probably one of the first, if not the first, Black African-Americans to graduate from the engineering school at Marquette in 1946 and 1948. And he was in Naval Science and all of that. But he uh, brought me back to be his vice president of his Milwaukee office. He lived in Topeka, Kansas. May he rest in peace. And he always intended for Milwaukee to be the flagship of the company. He was leaving a legacy behind. He wasn't out to build a nest egg. He had already made his fortune and uh, the 10 years I spent with him were great. It helped me understand how to run a business. And he didn't let me handle the finances, except I did get involved with invoicing and the like. So I did learn that valuable lesson that cash is queen. So Daphne would agree. And uh, so I knew that, that I needed to make sure that we had cash flow coming in, of course. And so, then I, he sold the company to me and three others. I had philosophical differences with one of my partners and, and said, well, one thing I, I don't believe in doing is if you are complaining about something, you can do something about either do something about it or stop complaining. I didn't like the situation I was in. Went to my other partner, said we, he doesn't deserve to be a partner anymore. They disagreed with me. I said, I can do bad by myself. And I left. And started my business in 2006 it was a great time to have started it in civil engineering and in public works projects the that was when the market interchange came along and all the other interstate highways that have come along since then so all the orange barrels that are out there we've we've been a part of either the design of in some small way or construction management in, in some small way as well so i've uh, been very fortunate to hire good people and we've gotten good projects and we've done well. Uh, my 
reason for Virginia and North Carolina was I wanted to find I wanted to get out of this climate and find a, a, a warmer climate initially. Now I have uh, two other reasons for wanting to get back to the East Coast, which are my grand twins uh, that live in Washington, D.C. still, where I relocated from. So I'm hoping to to uh, make some further inroads in Virginia and move back, preferably Hampton Roads area, Virginia Beach and Norfolk. Don't miss the traffic in D.C. So I'll stop. Awesome. I know you have more to do. No, awesome. Thank you. I love that. You answered many of my questions. I'll come back to you. But I wanted to, to circle back to Robert. Robert, if you could talk a bit about some of the projects that you've had um, in the past or currently and how those projects have impacted the community. And you can define what community it impacted. You're on mute, Robert. Thank you, Bruno. I apologize. Um, well, you know, Kamala, I do a lot of work in the Metro Milwaukee area, right? And as a Jamaican, you know, and having been a part of the community for, you know, almost 40 years here in Milwaukee, I know most of the Jamaicans in the community, right? So there have been several, like, restaurants that have, that have come to come online over the past couple of years. And I've been there with them to help guide them to, to build restaurants that are modern in fact meaning that if you uh, for example there's a customer um if you've ever been more an upper yard um public avenue i remember when when, when they were building that place canada they, they 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 did the construction and as they were doing the walls i met the owner I'm like listen before you close the walls up you make sure you uh, come in and do all your cabling or your low of cabling so that you can have all your data and your camera cables can be run prior to walls being closed up. Well, they're, they're, um, the company that does the construction, I won't call their name, <laughs> they went ahead and did all, all the walls were sealed up when I was brought in two months later. All the walls. So, so I, had to, I had to then spend so much time re-engineering everything to, to, to make it work, opening up walls again and running pipes between the floors. They were in pipes between the floors, Camilla. And there's three three levels. There's a basement, main floor, and an office on top. And I had to I had to go run um, put uh, three inch pipes between the floors because they weren't done. So so a lot of my work has been to help my customers understand that you cannot leave out the key part, which is your technology piece, right? In today's age, you cannot have a restaurant without cameras, and you can't you cannot have a, a, a rest register register without that's not using data, you know. So so I like to I like to uh, help them. To have the best uh, and modern technology in their operation, so they have less paper. For example, I don't like to print anything, so I'm, I, I I hate paper in paper because it's killing the trees. So I like to like do everything digitally. So I like I find ways to print stuff, you know, electronically. You know, they have a small uh, receipt printer. That's the most they print from, right? So my my goal with 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 being from the Caribbean, you know, I, I'm a I'm a tree hugger. Okay, so you know, I, I like the environment. So, so I like I like to do things to help to help them save on um, do the thing that, that will help destroy the the, uh, the, 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 the the economy. I mean, I mean, you know, the air, for example, right? So, I want I want customers to to be to be eco friendly. So, I, I I like to bring my knowledge to help them do that and achieve those goals by, by having a smaller footprint. You know, you know how much damage you know they, they, they do to do to they can they can they can do. Thank you. I like that. So, Robert, your work in Jamaica. How long have you uh, been doing that work? That's a good question. So, um, just before the pandemic broke in 2019, I started traveling back and forth to Jamaica more more regularly. And while there, um, I'm like, th there is so much need, especially. And you know, with, with 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 okay, so I'm from the country. I'm I'm a country boy. All right? I'm clear of that, right? So in in the school in my in my primary school that I went to, you know, they 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 don't have because of dollars, of course, the cost of it, right? You know, they not they haven't been exposed to a, a, a lot of technology. So I went back there, and I helped them to build a computer lab. In, in the primary school, right? So I, I went in there, I had them with the cabling. Um, I actually brought them a couple of pieces of hardware from here to Jamaica. But th there's a great need in the Caribbean 
um, for for with knowledge, right? And so the good thing though, for example, up in the country where I'm from again, um, they now have high speed fiber internet, right? So they went from copper, you know, this the bypass copper cabling straight to fiber. So up in the country, in my little apartment up in the country, I have I have um I have like a 500 500 meg connection <laughs> in my little apartment in the country. Whereas here in Milwaukee, where I live at my other house in Milwaukee, I have a 200 meg uh, megabit connection. But in the country, at the more rural part of Jamaica, Pamela, I have a 500 meg connection because it's all fiber. So, so, so I see a great need in the Caribbean, in particular, um, where there's a need to 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 have train those young minds. And so, um, I approached two of the schools in the area, um, three of them actually. Uh, to offer to, to, to do some um to do a boot camp, a coding boot camp. So Andrew Ash, my friend from, from MSOE, he actually said he would come down with me to teach a class at um two of the primary schools. Uh from um, but again, then we had we had the pandemic, so things kind of got hampered with that. But I intend to bring him down there still. And we want we want to do um I'm gonna I have I have a, a survey to bring down there um in October when I go to October because we want to um set up a 28 uh think line lab and have these kids uh start learning to code um uh, andrew will come teach them python and robotics because there's a need to, to for those young minds those young kids um even though you're the, the rural jamaica you can be exposed to all this to the technology that they, they see it they see on youtube because they, they have phones too so they see what's out there but they don't have the ability to, to, to work with it so part of part of my goal personally is besides um, establishing techway down there in Jamaica, is to help the rural parts of Jamaica where I'm from, to 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 help the kids learn the new technology that's out there because they need to learn. So so um, when it, uh, the kids, there's some bright minds in Canada, bright kids, but they just don't have the ability or know the and uh, they, to get to these technologies that are out there. That's awesome. I'm excited. I have a couple of questions regarding your project towards the end, but let me transition to Daphne. Daphne, I want to hear about some projects that you've been part of um, and how those projects have impacted black and brown communities. Well, only more like recently I've had those opportunities. Um, being an electrical engineering firm, I'm usually a sub consultant to larger firms. Uh, so I don't necessarily propose out as Zoe, uh, as the business as is, but through the years and the connections that I've had, um, I have had a few projects more recently uh, where uh, Zoe was able to uh, participate and impact the uh, our community one, which whether we agree or not agree politically, the IHOP project. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I have to laugh at that. But um, <laughs> I did work on that project um, and a uh, long time coming. And I'll leave that one at that. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to work for Bader, which is a big uh, community. They give back. The, the Bader family gives back. So there are headquarters on Green Bay Avenue I worked on. Uh, also, the Job Corps facility here that was built some years ago. I worked on that one. Uh, more recently, I've worked on the Brownsville Center of the Arts. I'm on the design team to actually build the new museum for the Brownsville Center group. Uh, and that's very much an honor and a privilege. I also worked on, uh, they, they renovated a home on North Avenue, which is within our community, uh, into a small office in a small um, gallery. So I had the opportunity to work on that as well. Uh, my heart has always been to work back into the community. So outside of projects, um, I go and I talk to students all the time. I think I'm on my 15 years of speaking at Upward Bound at Marquette. Uh, two of my close friends uh, teach there every year and every year I speak to the students. Sometimes there's three classes back to back. Um, whenever uh, I work with STEM, the actual you know group here in Milwaukee and the director, uh, Mr. Merkel, he, he asked me to talk to students. I wish people ask me to commit to boards and I'm busy, I really, can't. I'm, I am active with my church and our youth group, Rejoice in Jesus. And I'm very active with my family. I'm not married, but I have eight nieces and nephews who's also producing more nieces in, for me. So uh, I'm very active with my family community wise, but I am looking for more opportunities. So what I really do is I give back by speaking 
encouraging. I go back and I speak at tech career fairs. I've done that. I've spoken at MATC. I actually was an MATC board with the um, the committee that was that was transferring students from MATC into MSOE. I was on that committee for a while with Dr. Strangeway. I think we mentioned that. So um, I'm just now getting more into projects that are involved in the community, but personally, I've always had my foot in the community. Anything I can sure. do, even one on one with students, people are interested in engineering, I'll talk to them about it. So, sure. so yeah, that's yeah. been my background with the community. And your um, bio talks a bit a lot about your community involvement. So, thank you for mentioning that. That's mm -hmm. that's important as well. So, one question for Bruce, and then I'm and then I have some specific questions related to entrepreneurship for, to, for this team. Bruce, if you could share with us one of your projects and how it has impacted communities. Yes. Well, as I mentioned, uh, our work has been primarily with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. So uh, everyone knows about the work around the community, the Marquette Interchange, the I-43 corridor that's under construction now, um, the Interstate 94 corridor that went from the Mitchell Interchange down to the Chicago or rather Illinois uh, state line. Uh, the zoo interchange, I-41 going up to Green Bay and, and the like. Those are the types of projects that we more get into. I do try to pursue opportunities to do work locally in the city of Milwaukee and in Milwaukee County. It's as a smaller firm, it's just hard for us to compete on those projects. However, we are presently working on a project now where we're managing the construction, the reconstruction of the Leet Street between 12th and 27th Street. Um, the one thing that I that I keep getting when whenever I see Alderman um, Russell Stamper is is hey 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 why you know everybody keeps telling me that they don't see enough people that look like us out here why 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 don't you have more people out there that look like us and I'm like Russell I we don't build it we're not the contractor uh, Zignago is the contractor we manage the contractor. Mm -hmm. And I said, I can't tell them how, who to hire and who to bring on their projects. Our, our responsibility is to make sure they build the plan, the project according to plans and specifications. But I do try to hire people of color. I've had several African-American men and women that have worked for my company. I have two uh, African-American ladies that are with my company now. I have uh, two that are from, uh, that are Spanish and i have a young man that's from peru i have a young man that's from india that i'm sponsoring his citizenship for uh, that's another way that i've reached back i've i have sponsored five this is the fifth person that my little company is sponsoring become u.s citizens and one of them just became a u.s citizen last may um, he's he's from mexico he's one of the daca children as they call them came to to uh, the U.S. as a child, lived in uh, California. So I, I, uh, jokingly or 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 with humor, I I call him my straight out of Compton person <laughs> because he did. His family lived in Compton, and he was there in the '90s. And and uh, I told him at one point when he was with us, I'd like, hey, I'm a long time, long suffering Raiders fan, and he's like. Yeah, he said, I lived there when the Raiders were there, but he said, I couldn't wear Raider colors because that was, you know, that's what Ice Cube and all of them were wearing. And that was the Crips and the Bloods and the gang. So long story short, the young man stayed out of trouble, got his degree from UCLA and came here to Milwaukee. And and uh, I sponsored his citizenship. He was sworn in last year as a U.S. citizen. My first employee that I hired was also a uh, has now become a U.S. citizen. He was in grad school at, at Marquette. And when the zoo interchange project, I'm sorry, I keep saying zoo, when the Marquette interchange project was getting underway in 2006, I had an opportunity uh, presented to me that said, well, Bruce, we can put you on the project because I just started my company in February of 2006. And this was later in that same year. We can put you on the project, but we only have enough budget for somebody half time. I said, well, okay, that's a start. So let me see what I can do. Went to Marquette, found this young man named Omer Inigo. And he's like, yeah, I'm a 
getting my master's in, in construction management, but I'm only available half time. I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So that's how I hired him. And and now he and his wife who was Russian, well, ex-wife who was Russian, they're both now US citizens as well. So uh, again, if I, if I can find more people of color, especially African-American, I will hire. But two as well, I don't want to do the reverse. I want my company to reflect the community as well. We're 40% black. I'd like my company to be 40% black. We're about 25% right now. And then I say I have people from other backgrounds as well, Russia and the like. So that's awesome. where I'd like to try to do more in the community. Uh, I do work with others as well. I've, I've helped out the garden, Andre Lee Ellis. Mm -hmm. And I'm sponsoring also a, a young man that lives over in 53206. He and his brother, well, and his sister, they're all very um, academically gifted. So he's got a full ride to the same school I didn't want to go to. He's at Notre Dame University getting his degree in aerospace engineering. So I, I do uh, help him and his family out at uh, 12th and McKip. Uh, no, uh, I forget the, the street that he's on now, but awesome. uh, over there off of Ring Street. Thank you. Well, I got some specific questions for this team here. I'll start with you, Robert. And we're getting ready to take a path down um, entrepreneurship in, in education. So I want to know, since you guys are, are business owners, successful business owners for more than 20 years, did you take any business or entrepreneurship classes? How did you get your business acumen? Did you just wake up and learn how to do this? Was there some formal training? Share your experiences with me, Robert, as it relates to entrepreneurship training courses, business, business planning courses, et cetera. You know, that, that's been the best part about being an entrepreneur, Camilla, for me. So I remember in 2002, um, at the time, uh, Mr. Irv Palmer um, from um, Magnetech Engineering um, in Milwaukee, in Hampton Avenue. He's Jamaican, by the way, and one, one of the upstanding members of our community, right? And I remember when I went to him, I went to him and said, Mr. 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 Palmer, you know, yeah, I started I started my business. I'm doing this. Um, could I, could, would you would you mentor me, please? Could, could you show me like how, how to run a business? I have no idea what to do. I have, I have a, I, I'm a computer scientist, but I am not a business owner. And um, I made an appointment to see him. Um, he never did get back to me in that camera. And so I set out on my own to just, do, I, I, I love to read, right? And so I, I just read articles and, and how, how to do things. You know, the first thing I remember acquiring as, when I got my business was I got QuickBooks accounting software. <laughs> That's where I started, right? And so I um, I was always good with with you know with with like spreadsheets right so I you know I I'm good with when I'm working camera you know I, I would keep it I keep I kept a diary and in fact I have to keep the recorder so when when, when I thought of things that I you know before I lost my current thought I would either write it down or record it and then when I get home sometime in the week or weekend I would go and review those things that I wrote down ideas or thoughts that I had. And I would ask, I would ask people, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? And so some were helpful, some were not. But most of this, uh, the, the, most of the weight camera was like was like trial by trial and by error. You had to figure it out. Um, I wish, I wish that, um, especially in high school, and um, that we we learned about finance. You know, when we 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 learned about finance, how to manage money, because there 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 I was. You know, educated. I had, a good, I had a good corporate job, but you know, no one taught me about finance, even, even for your personal life, right? You got to figure that out. So, so I, I I applied just a lot of common sense, good good logic, and do a lot of a lot of reading, because I didn't really have anyone to mentor me on that, Camel, and, and which I think we lack today, and uh, and we need more owners of businesses to to, to mentor. The younger ones and those who are coming on board. Now, I'm 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 in technology. Bruce is in engineering, and so is Daphne. 
but we're, we have, we're now seasoned business owners who can give back to another engineer or another tech person, hey, um, you have your tech skills, but if you're going to do a business, here, here are some basic things you're going to need to run a business. You know, you, you, have, to run, you, have, to, you have to keep track of your receipts, for example. You know, you know so, so, so now I have, I have a smartphone, right? So when I'm traveling anywhere, when I, when I, when I, when I buy something on my business card, I take my phone and take a picture of it. So I have a record of it now, and so so that especially if if I use my business card, so not only do I have a copy of my receipt camera, I know uh, I can when I, when I get home I can enter it into my accounting software, right? But it's it's important that to begin the your accounting is so critically important when you're starting on this path, and for many people that's where the, that's where they stumble because they don't have it in place at the beginning. And they they they're down the path already. Uh oh, well I don't I don't I don't know what I did six months ago because it was never logged anywhere. So I, I think I think as owners who have been who have been in business for a while, we need to find people that we can um, help them to understand how to do business because this travel error. I mean it's, it, it was it was hard. It was hard. Yeah, work. It was hard. It was hard. Daphne, share your experiences. Did you take some business classes? Uh, uh, Miss OE, or did you take uh -oh. a business plan class? Share your 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 business acumen skills. How you obtain those? Well, we about to have church because um, I was a praying <laughs> sister. <laughs> I knew nothing. N u f f i n. Okay. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> but I did used to. Now I was very anal. I would balance my checkbook to the penny, so that was always important to me. But what happened was um. I was working in industry. Milwaukee's very small. I was working for uh, Siemens Westinghouse at the time. And they, I, I wanted to stay in Milwaukee area. So they was moving to Florida. I didn't know what I was going to do. Milwaukee's so small. I was actually on the original team that worked at Sears Toome Hill for all of the control systems at the sewage plant. And this was 1999, Y2K. Everybody was afraid. And um, my former colleagues had a business and they actually had the project to upgrade all of the control systems. And they heard through the grapevine that, you know, Siemens was moving. They heard Milwaukee, that Daphne wasn't moving. So they they sent, brought me to lunch and it was like, hey, Daphne, we're doing this project. You was on the original team. You know, we need your expertise to do the controls. I said, oh, I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do yet. I was single, they have any kids. I'm like, oh, well, okay, I'll come help you guys. And they're like, no, 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 no. You need to start your own business. And they were, they were, they were Caucasian. They was white, but I have really good, you know, relationships with them. They were like, no, we need you. And I said, then I'll work for you. And they said, no, you need to start your own business. And I was like, mm, 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 no, I don't think I want to do that. So I prayed on it, talked with my pastor. And I think over two or three weeks I was interviewing, but I didn't like the job offers I was getting. I didn't know what I was going to do. I said, well, I'll just move my home, my mama, you know? <laughs> And finally, uh, my pat I, I felt like maybe I should do this. And I remember I was talking to my pastor. I said, you know, I think I should start my own business. And he said, praise God, it's about time. <laughs> and so basically I thought about it. I said, well, this is an opportunity. I'm not married. I don't have any children. I mean, risk wise, you know, if you're going to do it, why not try it now? And so I bought a laptop, got a hard hat, um, thought I was going to do this for, I think the, 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 the contract was like for a year and a half and i'm like i'll see if i like it and now i'm looking 23 years later here i am and as far as preparing financially that is very key as well as who you know and talking to people and one thing i'll talk about the financial but i don't want to forget this being willing to walk away from a contract is also key because i remember at the time i had people that just want to pass through and then when I would say, when am I getting on the work? Well, you're not assigned anything. They're like, well, you just sit there. You know, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Either I'm going to work or I'm not. Or the other stuff that, that we can fill in on. But one of the key was I was able, I had didn't know when I was, you know, finished the project. I got a, like a $180,000 contract, was not invited to one meeting, was missing me, didn't know what was going on, kept asking questions, telling me I'm annoying them four months in and finally i said what is the deal i'm supposed to be on a design team and they were like well we're just gonna pass through we'll have you do a couple things but we just need you and i said you know what keep your project and i canceled the project i told the the, the owner which was mmsd and they had to get dealt with but I, I wasn't just sitting here just because i didn't have another contract you thought i needed you no 
So being willing to walk away, even when you don't see what's coming, is a key thing. And then I'll wrap up real quick. Uh, I said I was part of Rejoicing Jesus Ministries, and we had Bible studies on MSOE's campus. I was one of the, the teachers there, and we had students there, but we were getting, it was kind of not, not so many students that to be on campus, you know, you need presence. So I said, well, I'll just take some grad school classes, you know, and that'll, that'll give us till we can build up again. And um, I took corporate finance while I was still working, had no clue I was going to start a business. It was just for me to be an advisor and everything on campus. Went through corporate finance, learned about balance sheets, all that. Had never seen that before in my life. And then right after the class, that's when this opportunity came. And then I started my business. So I said, who's going to be my accountant? I'm like, okay, I got somebody at least that can say Jesus. Even not to say everybody say Jesus is is, is um, worthy, right? So I went through the Christian book and I looked through it and I just picked this guy's name. I went and met him. He also was happened to be Caucasian, but I met him. And he opened, he was so proud of me starting my own business, everything. He was my account for a year for free. He said, I'm not even going to charge you. And what he did was, even though he was established, even when I walked in from the sewage plant in the rain, wet with my boots on, was my first meeting with him. We sat down. He had businessmen in suits. And I used to work at Backracks. I knew they was wearing Hugo Boss $5,000 suits. <laughs> and he made them get out of their office, leave his office to meet with me. And then, and, 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 you know, I mean, he didn't poo poo me. He really treated me like a client. And so QuickBooks, when we sat down, he said, Daphne, get QuickBooks. He said, you, he said, you're an engineer. So you're smart. Do everything in QuickBooks. He said, then come see me. And ever since then that, that did it for me. So with, with the corporate finance class that I didn't know I was going to be in engineering, I mean, start a business and then uh, him telling me to use QuickBooks, he, he wouldn't do anything for me. He said, you're going to do everything. He said, because people always don't know what's going on at their finances, don't know what's going on. So ever since then, I would just print the quarterly, go to him, he'd check it and it would be fine. So after that, he told me I was one of his best clients because I actually did what he said. So he was my he was my accountant for at least my first 15 years that he retired. So that, that's my homework. experience. So thanks for listening. But yeah, that, you did your homework. You did your homework. Yeah. So, Bruce, share your experiences in, in the business realm. Um, you guys are STEM professionals. So how did you learn about business and, and, and match that with your STEM experience? Yes. Well, my my formal education was Horace Edwards uh, is how I learned the business side of things. The 10 years that I worked for Edwards and Associates is really where I began to have an understanding about business and how to run a business. I, when I first graduated from Marquette, I did, uh, I moved to San Francisco and I worked for a very large engineering company that uh, was doing work all around the world. I tried to go to Saudi Arabia, but I didn't get that opportunity. But uh, I did go to, I, I thought about getting an MBA. And so UC Berkeley, I lived in San Francisco and Berkeley is, of course, across the bay. And I took a couple of classes. I took macro, micro and accounting and then I moved away. So I didn't finish the fourth class. I would have gotten me eligible to, to apply for uh, the MBA program. So I never did go back to school to get a, any advanced degrees uh, or study even any more finances. My other training that during the 10 years I was with Edwards and Associates, uh, when I came back in 1993, uh, shortly after I was here, we had a meeting with Tyrone Dumas, who, who was with the city of Milwaukee at the time. And we were talking to him, trying to get some some opportunities for us to work for DPW. Uh, a couple of weeks later, Tyrone reaches out to me and he asked me, do I want to be on the board of a, a theater company? And so I ended up being on the board of the Hansberry Sands Theater Company. That's where I learned. QuickBooks. <laughs> I was I ended up being the treasurer for Hansberry Sands. And so I used QuickBooks. I was I was using QuickBooks for them all those years. So when we bought the company from Horace, I said I can still handle the finances, at least the bookkeeping side of it. I knew better than to say I was an accountant. So I didn't do that. But I but I said I can at least do the books and the accountant can look it over and straighten out whatever mess I make or whatever hopefully not too bad a mess. And just so happened as well at the time we were on King Drive and my accountant, uh, Robert Knows, is uh, Noel Williams, Williams CPA. 
And uh, so I met Noel when, when I was on the board of Hansberry Sands. And then once we started our business, I asked him to be the accountant for us as well. And, and today he's still my accountant. And uh, so I learned that way. And then I also, again, going back, I said, I learned the importance of cash flow. And I also learned the importance of, of staying in my lane, if you will, because when I started my business, I learned over those years in the service industry, you either have to do the work and find the best people you can to manage the business for you, or you manage your business and find the best people you can to do the work that your, your company uh, gets under contract. And so by the time I started my business in 2006, I hadn't done any actual engineering work for 13 years. Nobody was going to believe that I was going to sit down and do engineering again. And to be honest, I've never designed a highway in my life. So I certainly was going to screw that up real bad. So I knew that I needed to be the person to run the business and find the best people I could to do the work that the company brought in. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think a lot of people make their mistake. They're good at being a plumber. They're good at being a carpenter. And so that's all they do is they, they worry about that side of it, but they don't worry about the business side of it or they bring the wrong people in to take advantage of them or don't know what they're doing. And the other thing that, that I don't do is family and friends because mm -hmm. that's, that just ends up being a recipe for, um, uh, having a probably more than likely a, a very unpleasant uh, Thanksgiving, story. not a good Thanksgiving. Yep. Not at all. So I learned business from a very astute business person that ran fortune 100 companies and just an amazing person that, that shared a lot. And awesome. Um, well, I wanted, we have six more minutes and I wanted to use the last, five to six minutes. Uh, there were a few questions from our viewers um, and I we had five, but I've narrowed it down to two. And so whomever can answer this, it says, do you see an interest or lack of interest with the African-American community in regards to youth and STEM entrepreneurship? And if not, how will this affect the future of our culture? So there's a couple of, seems like there's two questions in there. Do you see an interest or a lack of interest with the African-American community regards to youth and STEM entrepreneurship? And if not, how will this affect the future of our culture? I say this, that, you know, from, from when I was in high school, Cameron, right? That um, the, 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 the black kids are stayed away from the, the, the STEM track. And that's a fact. I remember in high school, one teacher um, wanted to give me a, a add an A in my in my in my in my class, and this was senior in high school, and this teacher wanted wanted to get get me from an A to a C because I, I um part of part of my class part of my work study at Oster, um, I went to Jamaica for like ten days during the, during, the, during the break, and because I didn't go to work for those days, he wanted to uh, lower my grade from an A to a C. And I, I, had to, I had to go. I had to call. I had to go to the AP and M and all that. But I'm saying that to say this: that from then, from then, Kamala, the, the the teachers were uh, were pushing me towards going, to, you know, joining the military, for example, in high school, right? You know, um, whereas I was recruited by Marquette. So it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, what do you do? But but literally speaking, the cabinet um, teachers, you know, I can't speak for you know, like I'm in high school anymore, so I can't say this uh, to be true today. But you know, they're so talk that you know the, the, the black kids are are not being guided towards the, the, the STEM track. Um, you know, they are finish high school without taking any advanced math classes. You know, or they, they don't they're not they don't they don't have to. So therefore, they're not encouraged to do so. So when they get to, you know they, they're not big and they're not strong in math. So they are fearful of math because they don't know math. They're not being taught math. And as as we said earlier, that that's an important part of to be an engineer or a computer scientist, you need strong math skills. And so if, if you're afraid of math, you want, you know, you, you're gonna be you won't be in, 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 in those kind of jobs at all. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to jump in? 
I see that there's there's more just just from my personal uh, experience. When when I graduated from Marquette, there were four of us in my graduating class, four African Americans. Uh, when I went back, when I came back to Milwaukee, and now I go visit, uh, especially and more so my my alma mater. I mean, the first time I went back there, they had a national uh, national society of black engineers chapter there, and I literally was brought to tears because I saw so many of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. True fact. Fact. That's something to see, and, yeah. and our kids don't experience that. Yeah, just to I mean, see when I think about it now, you know that that's how it hit me. Mm -hmm. and, and even now, I still go back, and and there there are more African Americans and and people of color that are in those schools. But two, there's the U.S. also has this thing where, uh, and I and I hope it's going to change. But but we bring students in from other parts of the world give them masters and and phds and then say go home that's stupid to do that we're we're bring and then we don't let those of us right here be accepted into the schools now, i'm not saying that all this crap that I'm, I'm sorry all those things that these other folks are saying about how how uh, dei is is wrong and and do away with it not at all because it it is important i would i would not have gotten into marquette had there not been affirmative action. Mm -hmm. But once I got there, I earned my degree just like everybody else that was there that got their degree. And there are students there now that are doing great things. I've met some really talented young men that have come out of the city of Milwaukee and they've gone on to Marquette and now they're all over the world doing doing great work as well. And so I do see that, that there's interest, but there needs to be more support and more awareness early enough so that they can go right into a four-year institution. You can still do it in engineering. You just first instead may need to go to MATC and do the classes mm -hmm. that they didn't make sure you did when you were in high school. Sure. It's just going to take you another year or two longer. And right. don't worry about if it doesn't, if you don't get out in four years either. Uh, confession again here. Took me five years to get out, but I got out. And right. that was what was important. And once I've gotten out, now I own my own business. So this last question I'm going to give to Daphne. I think you, she will be able to answer this. And then we're going to wrap up here in a couple of minutes. So a uh, question says, in today's architecture, engineering, construction industry, it seems electrical engineers are scarce. What advice would you give to college students who are pondering the possibility of pursuing a career as an electrical engineer? You think I would have an answer because I've been looking for electrical engineers for the longest. <laughs> um, I don't know. Electricity that just doesn't seem interesting at all for some people. Um, I think it's similar to even what the answers that Robert and, and Bruce have said. We need to just make awareness of what type of engineering is out there. And, you know, if you say electrical engineer, people think power lines. You know, they might think the power company and like, I don't want to be climbing up a, a, a electricity pole doing that. You know, I mean, young, you know, because you and electrical engineer is so vast, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think we need to get them excited. I mean, I like the difference. I, I'm with with Bruce, like Robert. I, when I first was in school, I and still going back, talking to students. Yeah. Getting them interested. They're not interested, but I am graciously seeing more students interested like bruce was saying um in in um uh like upward bound and uh even though we have national side black engineers which i was a part of we have a, there's a pc component pre-college component also with stem the, the robotics competitions so i think the more that we do that um we will get the young people interested in engineering and then we can open up what engineers can do it's it's practically any nowadays with technology everything somewhat ties back to some level of engineering and if we can get students to understand that i think they will be more excited about the electrical engineering field as well as the other ones but we got to open open them up to to that mm -hmm. and so that's the key along with like i said what robert and bruce said we've got to get them in young get them excited about it and not just think it's this dreary thing uh, so I think we need to just open them up, 
open up the young people, talk to them. That's why I'll go talk to, to anybody about engineering. Is even though I talk about electrical and business ownership, I really go in and like, well, what's your dream? And I, I remember I'll do this one quick story when I was talking with Upper Bound. I'm even looking at ownership, not always working for somebody. So I'm, you know, raise your hand. Who want to be an NBA player? If it was, you know, and I'm like, no, now they, I was like, no, I want to be an owner. I don't want to be a player. I want to be an owner, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I remember I, I did a presentation on how to do a business plan. And I asked mm -hmm. the students something and one kid thought it was funny and said he wanted to do a car wash with women in bikinis. <laughs> I went with that. I did a whole business plan on that. And I said, well, you're going to have to pay the ladies because it gets cold in Wisconsin. So you're going to pay this much money. Then this is going to how much your, um, I said, this is a FICA, FICA one, FICA two. This is a social security. This is your workman. Comp. I did the whole thing. I did the whole thing. The ladies outfits, they got to get their hair done, their nails done. Okay. Then you're going to have to pay for this. And I said, well, let's keep it open. I had the other gender. So we're going to have men and, and their speedos. I did the whole thing. They was laughing. But the feedback I got was they said I was one of the best presenters because I'm like, I'm going to go with your passion and we can make your passion turn into dreams. Yes. You got to have the aptitude, of course. I don't if you can't do math, don't try engineering, but don't let it stop you. Don't be afraid of it. So, again, tap into their passion, but in their passion, show them everything they can do with that passion. Yes. Yes. It's not just the traditional field. So that that's what I think we should do and can do. And I see it's being done. Thank you. So we're at the end of our time. This has been awesome. Robert Gale, Daphne Wilson, and Bruce Spann. Um, I want to invite you for some future conversation about STEM entrepreneurship because there's so much more that we didn't get an opportunity to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to share with our audience, those who are viewing that next month on September 25th, we're going to continue this conversation, but we're going to transition to STEM faculty. And we're going to discuss what's happening in the classroom as it relates to um, women and black and brown students who are underrepresented in STEM and how we can increase that as well as discussion of STEM entrepreneurship in the classroom. So we're going to continue the discussion and I hope this panel will join me to flesh this out a bit more. It's been a pleasure to chat with you and I look forward to learning more about what you're doing in your businesses. Thank you for having me. All right. Have Thank a great evening. Thank bless. you so much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.